All right, thank you for your patience. Okay, so this is uh, part of a series we've had. This is actually our last of four events we're having this week. Uh, we so appreciate our partnership with Global Leadership Partners. And so uh, uh, Steve and Ron, uh, uh, Steve not, uh, Simpson and Ron Knopf are with us. Uh, so why don't you guys introduce yourselves real quickly. Uh, Ron, tell us just, uh, tell everybody who you are and where you're coming from to join us today. Sure. <clears throat> so. Ron Knopf. I live in Nashville, Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, as we call it here. I grew, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I've lived in Michigan, and I've lived in, in China. Um, I have three grown daughters that are married, and two of them have children, so I have four grandchildren, and one the, the third one's due in May, so that'll be the fifth grandchild. Uh, I also have an eight-year-old son. His name is Jonah Howe. We met him when we lived in China, adopted him. So uh, when I retired, so the last three years have been really busy for me. <clears throat> we, I retired from my career at Ford, repatriated after five years and tried to get back into the swing of living in the US, uh, adopted a, a boy, uh, three daughters got married. Uh, two of them have had children. So I've, we've added four um, grandchildren during the three years and the last one got married and she expects she's due and and life has been going really really fast for me and um, I joined Global Leadership Partners and <laughs> during this time period and I have been to Croatia a few times and visited and absolutely love your country and to, to spend time there. Thank you. Yeah, these guys were here as Corona started last year and it was an incredibly dramatic um, experience, but uh, I'll never forget it. So, and Steve Simpson is with us. He is uh, the co-founder of Global Leadership Partners. So Steve, maybe you could uh, introduce yourself and say a little bit about Global Leadership Partners. Yeah, uh, we started uh, two of us about seven years ago. Uh, it wasn't called this at that time, but two of us started traveling to Eastern Europe primarily to share information that we have on leadership, different leadership theme seminars throughout all Eastern Europe and now we're into uh, parts of Central Asia and Middle East. Uh, we opened it up and, and named it, we called it Global Leadership Partners about three years ago. We opened it up to many more speakers, including Ron, and now we have 65 speakers. All of us are volunteers. And normally we travel uh, over to your area to do these. But as mentioned, uh, COVID has changed our plans for the last seasons, last fall and this spring, and both Ron and I were in Zagreb with Nolan about a year ago last week when we had to get out right after everything was closing down. Um, so my, as far as myself, I uh, spent my career at Procter & Gamble. I was in engineering leadership. Uh, I worked in engineering and manufacturing. I lived in three different states and I lived in Japan and uh, uh, I left uh, some years ago, retired, and now I do consulting with uh, pri uh, private companies, pro profit and not nonprofit. I volunteer and I coach and I mentor and I do GLP. Uh, I've been married for 46 years. My wife and I have three married children and 15 grandchildren. And uh, hopefully in a few months, we're going to have our first great grandchild. Uh, so I live in Cincinnati. This is basically my home. And uh, so we, we lo I love Croatia too. I've been there now uh, a couple times and I, I enjoy being with you all. Thank you. Um, I'll introduce myself real quickly. My name is Nolan Sharp. I am not Croatian, but I'm a, a Hrvatski Zet, as some people say. My wife, Cassandra, is from, from Croatia. I've lived here for 20 years. I have two sons that are teenagers uh, who are in Croatian high schools. Uh, and I have been working as a part of Udra Focus the whole time I was here. Uh, before that, I used to be um, uh, an engineer and worked in Silicon Valley uh, for Hewlett Packard for a few years. Um, we're going to talk about three short topics. Uh, pray, pray or prayer for work, about getting work um, or, or getting to the, the work that you wished you could have. Uh, prayer at the work, at work in the midst of challenges and prayer for those we, we work with. Um, 
we love to respect differences of opinion and we have a you know, specific few things we want to share this evening. Um, I'd invite you to just, you know, be patient. Maybe there'll be some things you haven't heard before, some new perspectives. Um, uh, we, we would love to hear also your honest perspectives. I really appreciated uh, what people shared about um, their feelings about this topic in the, in the registration form that we sent out. Um, so I hope you can um, enjoy and be blessed by the, the discussion we're going to have. So the first topic is um, that we have in our time together is prayer. Um, oh, that I, I mentioned that. So prayer for work, prayer at work, those that we work with. So the first is prayer for work. And then again, it was very interesting for me in the survey that we did as people registered for this, that a lot of people said they felt uncomfortable about the idea of praying for work. Is it, is it important enough to God? Is it maybe selfish uh, 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 to bother God with your need for work? Um, and I was, I was thinking about that. I was thinking how, you know, in the, in the time of the Bible itself, there wasn't much employment in the way that we would think of it today. People probably worked in something that they inherited. They, they stayed on a farm that belonged to their family, or they went into a business that belonged to their family. So there wasn't there isn't a whole lot of people looking for jobs, say in the Bible. But I think the Bible is full of stories about trusting God for provision um, and working hard and working with skill, and that leading to good opportunities. So we just have for each of these three topics, we'll have like one Bible verse and one just very short um, suggestion of a place you can read about this in the Bible. So great verses for thinking about encouraging you in prayer for work um, would be Proverbs 3, 3 through 6. Um, and for these verses, I've used a, a, a new um, uh, contemporary translation of the Bible into creation, which I think has been really good for people to uh, have a place to, to read that's um, very readable. So this in English says, let love and faithfulness never leave you, Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. And I think there's just a, a, a really interesting combination there saying that if you, if you do this, if love and faithfulness guides you, then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Proverbs is an excellent book to read when you're looking for work or you're thinking about your career or your kind of life out there in the world. Um, and what it says are not you know, promises that are magical, that just everything will be okay, but it's kind of like saying, this is the way God uh, responds to us when we live in these ways. And so people who, who trust in this, I think generally do tend to see and are able to look back and say, wow, I see that God gave me favor, um, gave me a job, was able to help make my paths straight. Um, and uh, um, so Proverbs is a great book to read. It's, uh, it has 30 chapters. And so people often read it, or 31 chapters, people often read it through in a month, um, taking one chapter a day. Uh, a great biblical example or story, a short one you can read in about 15 minutes, is the story of the book of Ruth. Ruth is a woman who is married. She's not Israelite. She's married to an Israelite man who dies. And so, but she decides to go with her mother, mother-in-law, Naomi, to the land um, uh, and to trust that somehow she'll be provided for in Israel during a time of famine. And Ruth um, uh, takes advantage of a, of a provision in the Old Testament law that says that when you harvest your fields, you don't harvest up all of the grain, you leave it at the corner of the field so the poor can come collect it. And it's a great story about Ruth really showing initiative over and over again to go out and seek God's provision for herself and in a way that ends up really um, uh, unfolding in a very powerful and, and kind of uh, amazing way. So that's, that's a couple thoughts uh, that I had as I reflected on this about how uh, uh, Bible verses that are important for praying for work, um, maybe a, a biblical story you can read and reflect upon as you're looking for work. But I wanted to ask also Steve and Ron. So Steve, can you remember a time when you had to pray to really just get a job or to get the work you were trusting uh, to get and um, trusting God for and kind of how did that go? Well, I have many examples of that. Um, when I came out of college, it happened to be a good year for engineering. And I had nine offers when I stopped interviewing. 
And so I had a lot of choices, but each choice came with both a positive and a negative aspect where I would live, what I would do and so on. So it, it certainly took a lot of prayer to decide what I was gonna do and, uh, and how that was gonna be good for me and ultimately for a family. I was dating my wife at the time. So I had to think about the future uh, possibility that we'd be married. And, and so I certainly had to pray about that. And all throughout my career, when I've had, to, when I've had the opportunity to change assignments or have new jobs within the company, they always took prayer because considering that only God knows the future and we don't, you, I trust him to help give wisdom and insight. Now, I don't hear voices, but I do have that sense of peace uh, that he gives direction. And one of those big ones was when we moved to Japan, obviously a, a huge endeavor. And, and we prayed a lot, my wife and I, about that, whether this is be something that God would use. And each one of these times, I'm praying in light of not just the kind of work, but how will God use us in it? Mm -hmm. And we saw going to Japan as a mission field, an opportunity to cross-culturally minister to people. And so part of our motive in moving, and I've moved, I moved six times with PNG, uh, different states and across the seas. And each time it was with the, the idea of, Lord, don't just give me what I want, but give me what I need and what you want for me to do. Mm. And because sometimes what we want, you think about a child, they ask for everything they want. But as a parent, you don't always give them what they want. You give them what they need and what's best for them. And that's what I trust Todd for is ultimately a father who knows best. Mm. So, yeah, I prayed many times for every job that I had. Thank you. Thank you. Ron, uh, did this bring a story to mind for you? Yeah, <clears throat> it, sure, it sure does. Almost a similar story in, in a lot of ways. I was uh, at one time, I'll say 2012. Um, I worked in a, in, a, in a capacity at a particular factory, actually, in Cincinnati, Ohio. And um, I didn't like it. I didn't like the... The environment, the supervisor, my boss was very, very difficult to work with, extremely difficult to work with. And so I saw an opportunity to change careers and, and move it back into full-time engineering. At the time I was, I was in operations, which means I had some engineering responsibility, but a lot of operational responsibility. So I thought, I want to go back to my roots and be a true engineering whatever. So there was a chief of engineering job opening up in China. And so I prayed about it, got the interview, interviewed, and got turned down. Mm. I thought, well, Lord, apparently I'm not supposed to go to China. Um, and I was a little bit upset because I really wanted to, I was running a bit from the job I was in, but then I was excited about this new opportunity. So it was kind of a win-win a for me. Well, it wasn't very long. I'd say about 90 days later, I get a call and says, hey, look, you still want to go to China? I said, well, yeah, I do. But we have a different role for you. And it turned out it was much better than the role I wanted. Hmm. Uh, the peer engineering role was, um, was a lateral. It was just move to another job, do a different thing. But this was a promotion. And they had literally offered me a much better job that I was more suited for. And I got to go live in China. And, and I had dreams and visions of of sharing the gospel with lots of Chinese people and, and, and doing a lot of really good things for the Lord. And that did happen, but it happened nowhere like I had thought it would happen. And I might share some of that later, but it was, uh, again, me trying to think about what um, I think I should do or what I want to do. And then the Lord says, well, this is what you really should do and it's better for you. And it turned out to be uh, uh, quite a blessing. Thank you. Um, uh, before we move on, I just I was reminded of how um, uh, ask people to pray with you for for work if you're looking for work. Uh, it's a powerful thing. Uh, uh, today, this evening on this call with us is uh, Miha Kreko and a, a small uh, church I'm a part of. of there, um, we have some people who are who are refugees who are here in Croatia and face a lot of challenges getting work. And there's one 
one man we prayed for for a long time uh, to find uh, to find employment then and, and we re could rejoice together as a church then when he um, was able to get a job. So remember Proverbs, remember the example of Ruth. Uh, so let's talk about praying at work. You know, what is it? What do we what's that about? So, um, uh, you know, if you stop and think about it, we end up spending the best hours of the best years of our lives at work. Maybe we don't like it, but that is kind of the reality. Um, and if those years are unconnected from our faith, then it's a loss for us. It's a loss for the people around us who we come into contact with all the time. And I think it's really a loss for the world because God desires for us to be able to work as unto him in all, in all situations. Um, you know, think about when we pray the Lord's prayer and we start off and we say, we ask for God's kingdom to come for his will to be done on earth as it is on heaven. You know, I think the work that we do is a huge part of whether or not, you know, anything that's on earth ends up looking anything like the kingdom of heaven or not. Uh, many of you remember Drajan Glavash, who was the founder of Udruga Partner, and he wrote his doctoral thesis on the topic um, of, of uh, believers' attitudes towards work. And he called it believer on Sunday, atheist on Monday, because he saw this really big disconnect in so many of us between kind of what we do when we think about ourselves as having a Christian identity or we go to church, but then actually how we actually behave throughout the entire work, throughout the work week. And the verse that I thought is really applicable here is Philippians 4, 6 through 7, which says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I think it's just a really significant verse because it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. So in every possible situation, and if we spend 40 hours a week at work, a lot of the situations in our lives have to do with work. And in all of those situations, we should be able to pray and present a request to God. And there's a promise there too, which says that the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Um, and I think one a, a, a favorite story of mine is of being able to see, even in the Bible, somebody praying probably in, in quiet, just in their own mind, in the midst of a tough moment, is the example of Nehemiah. So the book of Nehemiah is in the Old Testament. It's about um, the struggles of the people after they were put into exile, after the kings fell, after they went into exile. Now they're starting to come back. And it's really, really hard. And Nehemiah was a servant to the king, Artaxerxes the first, and this photo you uh, see is of a statue, I um, mean, of a relief um, that has that was actually him, supposed to be him. And so this is the king of Persia. This is a huge emperor, and uh, Nehemiah served him, which which was a kind of a scary deal because if you served the king, and you showed up and you were not happy in his presence, he could have you killed. And Nehemiah is sad when he's in his presence because he has heard that, uh, that Jerusalem has been destroyed. And the king asks him, why are you downcast? Why, why are you not happy? And he says, well, I can't be because my, my home city has been destroyed, basically. And then the king says, so what do you want to do? And the king, the most powerful king in the known world to them then says, what do you want to do? And so there's this little verse in there. It says, then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. Well, if it pleases you, send me to go and rebuild the city. I just love that. There's a very quick little verse. He's probably surprised to be asked this question, but the, the fate of the nation uh, is, is, is kind of in the balance at this moment. And so he prays and he, and he speaks back to you know, this powerful authority. Um, and God hears his prayer and grants him favor in the, in the sight of the king. So um, yeah, I was uh, uh, curious, uh, maybe I'll start with Ron this time. Ron, can you think of a time when you needed to pray in front of the authorities of the Ford Motor Company or some kind of similar situation where, where prayer uh, meant a lot in the midst of work? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer the question, but it's not going to be about a big deal or a big situation because this is just not how it worked for me. Um, I'm not so sure if I prayed that much when I was in big trouble, uh, but I but I read a verse and it's First Thessalonians 5, 16 and 17. It says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. 
And the more I kept thinking about, well, how do you pray without ceasing? And I thought, well, if I go to work every day and it's, and it's really busy, there's a lot going on, there's meetings and there's things happening and decisions being made, this is impossible. How do you pray without ceasing? And I thought, well, so I actually, I literally asked my daughter this question. I said, I don't, because she's really good at, she's always in touch with the Lord and she prays continuously. And um, she's amazing to talk to. She'll do me some stories of things she's learned from deep meditation with the Lord. And um, she said, well, here's what I do at school. Every time I walk through a doorway, I say a little prayer because we're always on the move going places. And I thought, well, you know, I, I probably attend 15 meetings a day. And that's probably a minimum two doorways per meeting, if not more. And, and so I adopted this pray through the doorway program just to get me back on track for the day mm. and refocused. And something really amazing happened. That's why I say it wasn't a big deal and it wasn't a big problem, but anxiety, internal anxiety in my body began to leave. Because I kept getting these constant reminders that I, I'm, look, I get to talk to God here. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is big. It's, it's bigger than work. It's bigger than anything else. It's bigger than a problem. I'm talking to the creator of the universe as I walk through doorways. Isn't that neat? Yeah. I mean, and he's hearing me. And what happened was it was literally a change in my, my inner peace at work to be more calm, more comfortable, less anxious. And I think I became a better employee, you know, and I was much happier. Wow, that's a, that's great to have. I mean, that's a wonderful, short, simple spiritual practice that it sounds like great paid great dividends in your life. That's wonderful. Thank you. Steve, what's a time that you can think of the praying for the challenges at work um, is memorable for you? Well, I felt a little bit by ne like Nehemiah. Uh, right after I thought God was leading me to Procter & Gamble, and I thought it was my dream job. Within the first week, I hated my job. Wow. And, and the reason was this. The, the work they assigned me was an impossible problem that two engineers, two experienced engineers had already failed at. And so I was supposed to be the, the one to come in and solve it. Secondly, it was out of town, which meant I had to travel every week and I traveled every week for eight weeks. And on the eighth week, on a Friday, they told me I'm moving to that city. And by the next week, I was living there. And this meant I was away from my girlfriend. I was away from my home to solve the impossible problem. And I thought I was set up for failure. And that's all I could see. And in fact, I, start, I was in this double bind of, plowing down this route of failure or do I leave to, co co to take one of those other jobs but how would that look on my resume that I quit after a month or two yeah. from a company like P&G and that meant moving again and, and all that so I was desperate for God and I used to spend part of the day at work walking through the warehouse of this production plant praying out loud Lord, I need help. I feel like I'm going down the tunnel. Did you call me here or not? Is this really what you want for me or not? Did I mishear you? And I remember having this sense of, of God basically saying, I've got you where I want you and you have something to learn. And um, so I kind of made this sort of deal with God, if you can deal with God. I said, okay, Lord, help me to get through one year, one year of this company. And then we can decide, you know, are you leading me elsewhere or is this where you want me to be? But give me some wisdom on how to solve this problem. Well, what happened? That impossible system was impossible. And in fact, it was a failure, but here's how I turned it into a success. And this was thankfully the wisdom of God. I set out to prove it couldn't work. And I thought, if I, can, if I can't make it work, let me show for, for a fact why it can't work and prove it, and that would be success. And I ended up succeeding in that. They finally all agreed, you're right, this is an impossible problem, let's stop working on it. And then the job started getting better. And meanwhile, 
my wife and I, or my my girlfriend and I, got engaged, and then she we she we got married. She moved up to be with me. And at the end of one year, I was content, and I was happy. And in fact, then they moved me back to Cincinnati. Um, but I ended up with 33 years, and it was getting yeah. through that first yeah. year was the biggest challenge of all. And it was God trying to say to me, "Be patient." One. You've got something to learn. And two, you need to trust me in this. You know, one of the things I, I'd like to say about God himself, you know, there's many things we can say about him. One, we know he's sovereign. And we know he already knows what we need better than we do. The second thing is he's personal. You know, the, I, I like to say knowing about Jesus is different than knowing him. And when we know him, he is our ultimate best friend. And so can we pour our hearts out to our best friend? Yes, we can. He wants us to hear. He wants to hear from us. He already knows what we need. But in our prayer, we're acknowledging that we need him. Because mm -hmm. it's more than just what we need. We need him. And so... In his sovereignty, we're showing faith and trust that he's going to give us the right direction, just like a child would look to their father again, mm -hmm. because they know better. Well, God ultimately knows better. And so it was just leaning upon God to get through that first year. And that's not the last challenge I ever had, yeah. but it was a big one that got me through that year. So God cared about your job at your factory in Procter & Gamble Land, huh? Oh, yes. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, we'll have we have our last one. This will leave us uh, a lot of time for discussion. So, if uh, um, please uh, keep keep you know keep uh, keep a mental note of anything you'd like to bring up for us to discuss. Um, the uh, uh, the last one we'd like to talk to is about prayer for coworkers, uh, in the sense of um, uh, you know uh, what is our presence. In the lives of people we work with, and I think it's one thing that we are very passionate about in Uduka Focus and also in Partner, um, is that uh, uh, it's very important for us to 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 connect our lives to our work, but also our our lives to the people we work with. Uh, work tends to put us in the very close, long-term contact with people who are very different from us, and in our lives, many times, you know, over the course of our lives with family. Uh, with friends, with neighbors, we tend to spend more and more of our time with people who are more and more like us. Uh, and if you're, a, if you're a believer, then there's probably over time more and more believers in your close circle of friends. But work is often the place where we are most likely to be continually in contact with uh, those who believe differently or don't believe anything at all. And I think you've probably experienced that they're, that they're watching you, they're watching us. Uh, coworkers, clients, partners, they, they'll notice uh, our behavior and they'll notice whether it is in line with maybe what we say about ourselves. And so I think some Christians then tend to be very, very loud at work and then maybe uh, um, are going to be judged in terms of whether they always are doing right. Uh, some, some, many, I think many Christians become very quiet at work, uh, thinking I'd rather just not... Um, uh, give anybody a reason to to be uh, to be angry at God about who I am, and um, uh, so we're going to look at a couple passages, uh, one passage, and again one story uh, that helps us, I think, think through this. Um, this is a, a favorite set of verses of mine from the book First Peter three. First, the book of First Peter, chapter three, uh, where it says, "Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good?" But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. And so this verse tells us that a Christian is supposed to be always ready to give an answer 
uh, to anyone who asks for the hope that you have. So if somebody says, hey, what's different about you? Or why do you do these things? Or what is your faith about? Or what is the going on there? Um, we actually have a command in the Bible that we should be ready then to give an answer and to talk about it. Uh, it shouldn't be something that, that we then completely uh, be silenced by. But there's an, it's, I think it's wonderful it says here, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, basically saying so that if people you know, are gonna speak badly about you, they're actually gonna end up feeling bad about it because they're going to be realize I, I shouldn't, have, shouldn't have slandered that person because they're actually a good worker, their, their, their words match their lives. Um, so this has always been one of my um, favorite passages about, um, uh, about the, the presence of a Christian in their workplace. And if somebody, if you're wondering, well, how, how do you give an answer? I mean, what do you start talking about? Do you start talking about the, you know, I don't know the, like, where do you start or what, what's, what's the point? Um, I thought you might enjoy this diagram if you've never seen something like this before. This is uh, uh, something we often use in, in, in focus. It's called the four. And so it's just four simple little symbols that can, you can use to help just very quickly explain to someone, what is this hope about? So the first love is just God, God loves us and has a plan for our lives. A second one is the division symbol, often maybe a little bit of a different division symbol in, in creation is used more often, but that's a division symbol. And it says, but we are divided from God by sin. So the first is that God loves us, but the second is that we, we have all sinned. And the third one is the cross, that Jesus is then the solution uh, for God, that God gave for sin by sending his son, um, uh, not to condemn the world, but to save it. And then in the fourth one is a question mark that then says, but the question, the, then there's a, we, we have to receive the gift um, of, of Christ in order to be saved, to know God, to, for that division to end and for us to experience God's love. And that's something you can say in, you know, almost an elevator ride, right? It doesn't necessarily, you can, of course, go into a hundred times more detail and talk about Bible verses and stories and all those kinds of things. But the basic message is super simple. And I think that's something that, um, we, we um, from the Bible, we see we have a reason to be able to, uh, to speak of the hope that we have. Uh, and real quickly, uh, I was in a discussion about this with Christian Led a few weeks ago, so this one was kind of on my mind. There's a very interesting couple in the, in the New Testament in the, uh, that shows up in a number of different places. They're a married couple. Their names are Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila is the husband. Um, and they were basically small business people. They had, they, they had a business making tents or it's a little bit unclear what exactly it was. Was it tents or was it something like the coverings that you use in the marketplaces like a Nadstrichnice would be in Croatian. Um, uh, but they, they had some sort of a business uh, making these kinds of coverings. And it's, they moved around uh, to different places because they're mentioned in different cities. And uh, every time they moved around, it seems that they were doing their business. But they were also then had a church that would meet in their home. They would um, uh, use it as a platform for their ministry, as a way to share the gospel with other people. And I'm sure that a large part of their work and their their witness for Christ had an awful lot to do with their customers and the people they worked with. And they, I, I, I imagine that they both were good at what they did, um, and also uh, knew how to use every opportunity, like the First Peter passage says, to to speak of their hope, which is in Christ. Um, so yeah, and I, I think uh, this will maybe be slightly more uh, in-depth stories, but uh, Ron and Steve both have really, really fascinating experiences. This was the, one of the main reasons I wanted to, to do this time with them was to give them both a little bit of a chance to talk about their experiences um, uh, uh, in the, being workers in the workplace um, and uh, sharing the gospel um, through that experience. So this is, yeah, that's my last slide. So I'll go ahead and turn off the, the sharing so that maybe you'll see better um, view of their faces when they start speaking. So yeah, let's see, uh, who did I pick first last time? So Steve, what's, uh, what's oh, Ron first? Okay, let's do Ron first then. He's, Steve is pointing at Ron. Ron, tell us about this experience you had when you were sent to China. And um, uh, I mean, tell us a little bit about what that's like, uh, the, the, what, what, supposedly you're allowed to do there. And, and also, uh, I mean, I'll say this, and then you guys can respond, each one of you respond to this, but American 
cor large American corporations are not known for being enthusiastic about the idea that their employees, and I think especially their managers or executives, would be speaking freely about their faith or even influencing the people around them. So yeah, Ron, how, what happened? And tell us some about that. Sure. Uh, you, you know, you, you're right about the large corporations. I think they live in fear of lawsuits or something. So they try to keep the environment, you know, all business. Um, and, and, but many people are believers. You, you meet believers and people of faith everywhere around you in, in at least a U.S. corporation. And so you, you know who they are. And, and, but, but, but things are a bit quiet, typically, in terms of sharing faith. This was, was very normal. You wouldn't, it was very rare and, 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 and occasionally not. But anyway, so <clears throat> then at, at one point, I go to China in 2012. And I go there and, and it's really different. You know, um, there aren't any churches. They, 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 there actually was one church in, in the big city of 37 million people that I was in. And it was, um, I, I believe it was a Catholic based. Um, the, the, the priest was appointed by the government and the sermons were pre-approved. Yeah, wow. <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> they were quite uh, sterile, I'd say, in, to say the least. Very good stories though phenomenal story. So I, I did go to that once and it was very interesting um, to go. But what I did find out, there was a breakout in a small group and I think there were many believers around and amongst the small groups that were sharing mm -hmm. the gospel. So that was very encouraging. Um, but, but there was a big void. It was a big void for my, my Ford team uh, in terms of what they were used to in life and having a church family and, and, and fellowship. And we were there, I'm the, well, I was the first person on the ground from my team. So we were a bit lonely for a bit, uh, at least with having friends from the US or workmates. But quickly we brought on uh, 26 um, people from around the world, mostly from the US, which, which came with wives and children. And so there were families. And then I met other expats in the, in the region and, and there was just a huge blank for, for what do we do for, for fellowship. My wife and I looked at each other and said, we're just going to open our home. We're going we're gonna to open our home and invite people and we'll just have a Bible study. And we'll, we'll do something really simple. Uh, we had both been part of a Bible study fellowship. Some people know it is BSF. It is a global Bible study. And we'd been in part of that for 10 years and had some wonderful studies we could work through. We started, started opening our home. Um, Wow, it just went, it went viral almost. We, we, there were times we had up to 90 people around us. Uh, now, my apartment was only about 2,000 square feet, uh, which is decent size for an apartment. That's uh, 200 <laughs> square meters. So yeah, that'd be a big, really big place here. Yeah. Right, right. But, so but still, would, 90, yeah, 90 people, wow. We would find ways, to, the good news is we were in a tropical zone of the world. So it was never, ever cold. Winter was not cold. Uh, and summers were very, very hot. Um, so we were able to find spaces outside to meet. And, and we really, in the end, God created a, a, a family of believers that came together from really all different faiths and backgrounds and different religions. Nobody cared if you used to be whatever, Presbyterian, Baptist, Church of Christ, it didn't matter. And there's, there's all these faiths out there that, that I think I, I'll hold my opinion on because I just get confused because there's too many. <laughs> so, so it hurts my head to think about it. There's one Bible <laughs> and it's pretty consistent. And so I, I struggle with all the different denominations personally, but uh, we just open it up to people to study, just to learn. What does the Bible say? And it worked really, really well. And we created a, a, a very close knit community. We still have reunions today. Everybody is gone. No, no, nobody's there anymore from that group. Everybody's moved back to the U.S. or whatever continent they came from, and um, but we still have we have WeChat reunions where we sit and talk and catch up and we share and and it, and it was just it just ended up being a just a wonderful experience uh, to have fellowship with other people and they're really people I worked with many of the people I worked with in the U.S. and it's those people I yeah I knew they might be believers but I wasn't really sure because we never really talked about it uh, but now I find out that that you can learn from everybody. Um, so that, that was a wonderful experience and, and, and we're glad that this, and, and kind of a, the, 
the best part of the story is uh, about a year in, a guy from another division of Ford, the vehicle operations, his name was On, a uh, Korean fellow, was, had been through seminary, and his, but he was, a, he was a body side engineer. So he's designing sides of cars. That's what he does. But he's, he, he's been completely through seminary. He, jo- he hears about the group he joins and literally becomes our pastor, if you will. Uh, so I, I, I didn't have to prepare or work hard in a, in a, in a, it was something I'm not that great at. I'm not a pastor. I'm, I'm really, I do love the Bible study, but he, he added a, another element to that. That was just wonderful. But, but I want to tell one more story about, about sharing the gospel because it's very important to me. Um, one time at Christmas, a fellow walked into my office and he said, Merry Christmas. I said, Merry Christmas. And, um, and it just occurred to me, the Lord said, you need to talk more about Christmas. And I said, hey, um, what's Christmas mean to you? And he said, well, family gets together, lots of gifts, celebration, parties. I said, yeah, yeah, I agree. That's, that's a cool part about Christmas. He looked back and he says, what's Christmas mean to you? Great question. So I'm, I'm studying how to ask spiritual questions or have crucial conversations because ultimately I want to share who Jesus is, but it's hard. You can't just uh, surprise somebody with this. Hey, Jesus is this, if, you, if that's not where their, their head's at or what they're thinking. And I said, well, I think Chris, we have Christmas because we need Easter. He said, well, that's an odd answer. I said, yeah, it's really all about Easter. We only have Christmas so we can have Easter. Well, that ultimately led to a question of, of Good Friday and, and, and the resurrection. And, and what did it mean for Jesus to die? Why did, why did he have to be, he had to be born so he could die. And anyway, the conversation went extremely well, better than I even imagined it would go. Um, and ultimately this young fellow, this is, for, this is literally, we were having a meeting on strategy and finances. That's what the meeting was about. <laughs> but then as we walked away from the meeting, it all changed with that question about Christmas or just saying Merry Christmas. And ultimately the, the young fellow um, accepted Christ very soon. I'd say within a, within a week, uh, he, 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 he asked the Lord um, for forgiveness and wanted to be uh, develop a relationship with Jesus and, and, and he moved forward. And, and I'm still great friends with him today. We communicate on a regular basis. And I'm just amazed to see his, his growth in Christ and the Lord. And, and, um, and I just want to share that because it says be ready. Um, sometimes I think we have to be intentional. Maybe mm-hmm. we need to think about good questions that, that might lead to a, a spiritual conversation that, are, um, that people can accept and, they're curi- and, and, and add some curiosity. And that's just one of my, one of my examples. That's, that's really... That's really wonderful to hear. And yeah, both both that uh, you had a big story like that of uh, uh, God using the opportunity that you had and then uh, um, or just being in the moment then when something just as simple as saying happy birthday and I mean, I mean Merry Christmas. Uh, I, I remember when I, uh, when I worked at Hewlett Packard, we had a prayer group of a few of us who uh, would meet every couple of weeks and have a prayer time together. And, and that was mostly people who were already, you know, very engaged in their faith. But uh, towards the end of the time that I worked there, it started to become clear that our, we were maybe going to be shut down or sold or something was going to change. And it was amazing how, because we already had this prayer group going, when that happened, then a whole bunch of people you wouldn't expect started to attend these meetings close to the end there, because we were all afraid. We were all wondering kind of what happens next. And so being prepared and investing in things even you know you, you don't know and, and and the whole atmosphere in a workplace changes when people are wondering are we all gonna lose our jobs and and the conversations just went from being always you know about money or fun or whatever to really serious questions about I don't know what I'm going to do about this or that and um, you know it just uh, you never know how th- quickly things may change so it's great to be prepared. Mm-hmm. Steve I, I'm I, I've heard some of your stories years ago and I've really enjoyed them so I'd love to hear some of your experiences about praying, praying for your coworkers and being a light of Christ to them. Thanks. I, I had many opportunities to share Christ, but I want to tell you one story that for me was the most meaningful of, of all. 
I shared an office with a man back in the late seventies. He was a Jewish man, not practicing, but Jewish. He was a brilliant engineer. Uh, he went on while he was working to, to get two master's degrees and a PhD and keeping his full-time job, PNG. And I shared this office with him and, and he was rather arrogant. Uh, he was so smart that he looked down on people who weren't as smart as him, which included me. And so um, our relationship was tentative because um, I don't think he had as high respect for me uh, or anybody else around him. And uh, I prayed a lot about Joel. His name was Joel Kahn. And I said, oh, Lord, I, this seems like the impossible task here, but give me, give me some ideas here. And uh, I enjoy reading the Old Testament. So I started to ask, I, I came in the office and said, hey, Joel, did you know that in Genesis, this particular story, do you know about this story? And he would laugh and say, no, Steve, I don't. Why are you reading Genesis? That's the Torah. You're a Christian. I said, no, the, Genesis is really important to Christians. And, and in fact, I believe that the whole Old Testament points to the Jewish Messiah. And so I read it a lot. And then weeks later, I would do it again. Hey, I'm reading in Exodus, this thing. And, and I kept doing this until finally he says, Steve, I'm kind of embarrassed that you, a Christian, know more about the Torah than me, a Jew. I said, well, there's something you can do about that. You can read it. I said, okay, I think I will. And so he started reading the Old Testament. Eventually, our assignment, that project came to an end, and we separated but he kept in contact with me. He'd call me up and he says, Steve, I've got questions. Okay, let's have lunch. And we would talk over passages of the Old Testament and I would explain them to him. And I'd always seek to show how it pointed to Christ. Didn't force it on him. I would just say, by the way, this is what I believe. I know you don't believe this, but this is what I believe. And as he read, he says, you know, I feel kind of guilty. I've never gone to synagogue. And I said, well, I think you should. And so he started attending synagogue and eventually he had so many questions that I invited another man, a, a messianic rabbi, to sit in with us. And he taught both of us Old Testament and continued to learn together. He eventually got to the end of the Old Testament and he called me one day and he says, Steve, I'm going to read the New Testament. Okay, Joel, go for it and let me know when you have questions. And he started reading it and he was just shocked at what he found surprised at the stories. They're so different than what he had been taught about Christianity. And we'd get together and talk about them. Well, finally, at one point, and he'd resisted the whole time, he says, you know, if I become a believer, a Christian, I get excommunicated from my Jewish family, and I'm separated from the community. I just can't do that. He said, I understand, Joel. But one day, he called me. He said, Steve, I did it. So what do you mean? What'd you do, Joel? He says, I believe that Jesus is Messiah. My answer was, why? <laughs> why do you believe that? And he explained to me the amount of knowledge he'd gotten. And he, he had a problem, something that his rabbi had said in the synagogue. And he confronted the rabbi. And the rabbi's answer was just not sufficient. And in fact, he realized the holes in what they believed and saw how Jesus filled those holes. So I said, let's get together. So for the next year, he and I met regularly, studied the Bible, I discipled him. Now, let me explain that the period of time from my first question to him about something in Genesis to that time was 15 years. He and I had been conversing for 15 years. Wow. Now, the other thing you don't know about him is he, when I first met him, he had a physical problem. I couldn't tell. He, he didn't know what it was at the time. He was limping a little. And I'll make that short. He ultimately found out he had MS, and it was a degenerating MS. And he spent his whole life going downhill to where he started with a cane, then a wheelchair, electric wheelchair. And eventually, he couldn't hardly feed himself, but he was still working. The company hired people to assist him, to type for him, because they appreciated his mind, and he didn't want to stop working. I got a call then when he was 59 years old from his wife, 
And she said, Steve, Joel's in the hospital. So I went to the hospital to see him. She wasn't there. He was, he was asleep. In fact, I guess I, he'd been unconscious for several days, hadn't spoken. And uh, he woke up. I prayed for him right there while I was sitting next to him and just, just waited. And then he woke up and he saw me and he smiled. And we talked for two hours. He hadn't talked for two hours in weeks. And we talked. And ultimately, this is what he said to me. And this speaks to 1 Peter 3.15. He says, Steve, you know, I've been approached by Christians. I was approached by Christians for years trying to make me a Christian. And I rejected them all. They all wanted to convert me. And, and I just blew them off. And I wanted to do that with you, too. Do you know why? You, you, he says, you are course my spiritual father the what he called me i don't claim that but he says you're the person who led me to christ he said do you know why i listen to you nobody else i said no i don't he says well you never shoved it down my throat you kept telling me things giving me facts giving me truth and then you let me ask questions you would answer my questions but you never said, you have to do this, you have to do that. You led me and spoon fed me all along the way and you just loved me where I was. And ultimately it was that love from you and that continuing to answer my questions that caused me to see the truth and believe it. Well, I appreciated his telling me that and it was a reminder of what we do, we do with gentleness and respect we certainly pray. I pray for him, and I'm still praying for his wife, who never became a believer. Two days later, he died, and um, I went to his funeral, and I met his messianic church. He went to a messianic church after that, and I met his pastor, and uh, turns out uh, we had a lot to talk about. We went out to lunch together, and I reviewed the first 15 years of Joel, and he reviewed the next 15 years of Joel, and we had a 30-year picture of Joel's life, of his journey with Christ. So, you know, sometimes you wonder, why am I in this job? And why did God put me at PNG? If for no other reason, it was Joel Kahn. You know, all other things pale in, in significance compared to the walk that I had with my friend and showing him who Christ was. Wow, that's... That's an amazing story, and uh, it was such a great reminder of how um, we should, yeah, trust in God and never give up, but but, but always be respectful. I think that's uh, um, something that you know many people really struggle with. Is ma many of us would be rather, we would, it's so much easier to go to extreme, right? To either say nothing or to get really loud and push really hard, but to to be patient and to give things time um, and to keep praying for people. That's that's an amazing story. Well, I am glad to see that we got through kind of the, the program part in, in an hour, but we're scheduled for a 90 minute uh, discussion. So, um, you know, now it's quite open um, uh, for you to, you can write a question in the chat. You can write it in Croatian or English. We can translate it. You can unmute yourself or um, uh, show your camera and, um, you know, ask us and you can ask really anything on your mind. There's really no reason not to, uh, no, no, no topic I think is kind of off limits as, as long as it has anything to do with um, the Bible and uh, 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 prayer, uh, prayer at work. Um, yes, please uh, uh, let us know what's on your mind. People are thinking, did, did either of you ever get in a little bit of hot water uh, based on praying at work, for work, <laughs> uh, with people? Uh, no, I never did. And uh, one of the things that I did in my office is I, I used things in my office to sort of 
put up a flag to say that Christian is spoken here. Huh. Uh, I was in somebody's wedding once and they gave me a little extruded cross about three inches tall. And I just kept that on my desk. Mm -hmm. And I found that that was a magnet for people. Hmm. Um, they would, they, not everybody, but for some people, they would come just to talk to me about very deep and personal things because I think they believed that I trusted God and that I may have some answers for them. And that's how many conversations got started. And the company never frowned on that. I, you know, we're able to be who we are. We just had to be careful to honor our employer. Uh, and, we, and I did, I tried to use you know, my time discreetly and over lunch and after work and so on. But nevertheless, uh, it was a way to signal that, that uh, and I had to live it. You know, when you put something like that up, you better live it too. Because if you don't, you, you look like a hypocrite. All right. Did you ever get in trouble, Ron? Uh, actually, I can't say that I have. I, um, like Steve, I always try to, to, to live well and do things that I think would be pleasing to God. I, I did feel like there was pressure to to um, to not. How should I say this? I remember I'll tell you, I remember a story that um, we were going to meet with a very very high powered executive, and it was going to be a bad day because the results weren't good, you know. And 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 I remember the the boss came to me, and and, and I don't, I don't want to just. Like I'm puffing myself up because actually at the time it was a little shocking to me. And um, he said, um, you know, everybody's going to the meeting with so-and-so, but you're not. And I said, <clears throat> okay. And can I ask why? Because I felt like I was left out. <laughs> so he said, he said, because no matter what happens, you're going to tell the truth. He goes, in this meeting, we may not want the truth to be evident as you would like it to be evident. And uh, I took that as a compliment <laughs> uh, that I was left out because uh, maybe that people were kind of going to hide the truth to, to get, you know, survive their job or something. But, but I think um, he knew that, that he didn't want to put me in an uncomfortable position. If I was asked directly, uh, I would give, I would give the, the truth to the best of my knowledge. And I, I think he, was, he didn't want me to put me through that, knowing that, that it was not probably going to be the best meeting to be in. So. Anyway. Thank you. We have a great question that came in. Thank you so much for asking. It said, uh, please, could you tell us something about how to get a job? Many people in Croatia struggle with this, me especially. Um, uh, you guys are both uh, um, sort of <laughs> overachievers, um, but uh, I'm sure there's people you love or people you have been um, very close to over the years who have really struggled to find work or in, you know, maybe you're in fields that are particularly difficult to find work and how any thoughts you have on praying with people as they're looking for work or how or even it's, it's kind of a broader question then is kind of what what advice do you give for people who are two people who are struggling to find work well as ron quoted before you quoted you know trust in the lord with all your heart don't we don't lean on our understanding our own understanding because our own understanding is limited in all your ways acknowledge him and he makes our path straight. So what does that mean? Does that mean he gives us everything we want? No, it means he gives us what we need. Um, there, when we pray, there are three answers, at least three answers God gives. Yes, no, and wait. And, mm. um, and we don't know always what those are, but it's a matter of the heart. Do we trust him for our well-being, for supplying our needs? Now, I don't know if you're speaking of the mechanics of getting a job. You know, that's a whole different seminar. I could, I could teach a seminar on that. Yeah, but you, could sign, talk... you could sign up for one of the slots and then uh, maybe get some <laughs> yeah, more yeah. individualized tips. Yeah, but, but in terms of trusting God, it's, 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 you know, doing the best you can and, and striving to, to be the best you can be, but opening up your hands to God and saying, what are your will and not mine? And the one thing I tell people about uh, when we talk about coaching and about getting jobs is to go at it with confident humility. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? Well, confidence that 
you know who you are, you know what your skills are, you know what your talents are, and you want people to know that. And, and hopefully it's a value to somebody, uh, an employer. But that's coupled with humility that says, even that, in that, you know you have a lot more to learn and you're willing to learn. And so a person who's overconfident is arrogant and a and person who's underconfident doesn't give an employer confidence in you. And a person who isn't humble is, is arrogant or a person is overly humble. Again, you don't believe in yourself. So that right balance of confident humility, confidence and humility. And in part of my confidence personally is not in my own talents and skills, but it's in what God can do in me and through me. And I believe he's given us all something. He says in, in Ephesians, for we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works. Now they don't save us. They don't give us eternal life, but he has designed us to do things and he has assignments for us. In Psalm 108, eight, it says, uh, uh, David's playing, uh, do not neglect the, your workmanship. You will full the, fulfill the purpose in me. You will fulfill your purpose for me. And I trust that verse. He fulfills his purpose for us. I pray you don't forsake the work of your hands. And who's the work of his hands? We are. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I uh, I mentioned uh, that uh, by, uh, when the seminar started that there are some some uh, spots available to have a one hour conversation with Ron or with Steve. And the way to uh, get at that is that um, we have a survey for the uh, seminar itself. There's a link I just put in the chat window. Um, and if you uh, are interested in getting uh, some time with uh, either Ron or Steve, uh, fill out the survey. It just ask a couple questions about your experience of the seminar. And um, But there's also a place to, if you would like me to get in touch with you about setting up one of those slots, to hopefully tomorrow, Saturday, or on Monday, um, then uh, um, just fill in your name, uh, email, and phone number in there. So that was a really, really good question. Um, I maybe will be a little bit bold because uh, uh, just thinking about a couple of the people I, I know here on this call, uh, maybe, oh, okay, good, someone, uh, uh, well, I was gonna call on you anyway. Okay, so Michal said something. Um, uh, I read somewhere the following sentence. Um, God waits and answers our honest prayers and responsible deeds. Uh, uh, so pro, what about prayer without being responsible in your deeds? Uh, um, uh, what, is the, huh, what is the relationship between prayer and acting responsibly? I guess that's a question. Did you ever know anybody you had to say, uh, you might need to uh, um, not just pray so much, but actually get out there and do some work or... <laughs> you know that was really my first thought when on the last question is is um you know god does tell us we need to be busy and work we're not we're not to be lazy we're supposed to be out and go 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 and and sometimes that full speed and attitude to move forward talk to people look for ways to improve your own skill set um, allows you to stumble across Know, opportunities. Um, yeah. There's really this attitude of, you know, today is a good day because the Lord made today. Mm. The Lord is my savior and I know it. There's always hope and that positive attitude. I'm going to just get up and go and, and, and just try to do the right thing. Uh, whatever, whatever that looks like. Um, I think good things just happen. Uh huh. This, uh, uh, yeah, I want to loop back to, uh, or actually, I'll, I'll, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to this. Mario, that's a great question you just asked there. Um, uh, yeah, I think um, uh, uh, we also have done a number of seminars on, on looking for work. And I think what's a little bit related to, um, to the issue of prayer is also um, uh, really to not get alone. When you're working for, looking for work is a hugely stressful, difficult place to be, to be unemployed and to be trying to find work. And I know many, many people who've had long-term unemployment uh, in Croatia. And I think that, um, uh, you know, the, 
the there's a lot of language in the Bible about lightness and darkness and things that happen in the dark and and how then uh, Satan comes to steal and to kill and destroy and so um, when you're looking for work you're not necessarily with a group of people every day and so I think it's a a, a really great uh, wise thing to do to choose to to be with people you know to go to be a part of a a prayer meeting um, regularly where other people are going to hear about what you're struggling with um, uh, to, to, and to be out there. Because if you join, even if you're not actively looking for work, if you're going to join, you know, even if it's um, volunteer projects and things like that, you'll be around other people and you never know. Many, many jobs are found through informal channels. Um, and uh, sometimes it's because you just, are working hard and doing volunteer work well and then somebody notices and says hey you know i i know somebody's looking for a job and doesn't want to necessarily go through a whole big process um and i come i've come across that a lot um so don't let yourself get isolated because when we get isolated then we feel depressed and then we feel like it's all bad and there's a lot of space i think for the, the evil one to work when when we feel isolated so that's something to be careful about um uh, Mari, uh, someone asked that she said she had a problem hearing with the sound when you uh, mentioned the advice that your daughter gave you, Ron. So if you could um, uh, maybe repeat what was what your uh, when you're talking about prayer and the advice your daughter gave you. Somebody just missed that. If you could say that part again. Sure, I'd love to. So, so I was studying and trying to learn what does it mean to pray without ceasing, because when I thought about that is, well, I have to do work. I have to think I've got things to do in my vocation. So how in the world could I possibly go to work and, and do my job well and be praying all the time? So I didn't, I just, to me, it was, I was just trying to contemplate what does the Lord really mean by pray without ceasing? What he means is have that attitude of prayer and, and, and you're, you know, he's with you, um, whether you're actually praying or not. And I just ran it by my daughter to I say, hey, you know, what, what do you think about this? And she gave me a little tip that, that she did at school and I adopted it at work is, is uh, when she walks through a doorway, um, she does a, a real quick prayer, just a kind of a quick, a reset, a refocus. And it, we're talking about moments here. And um, I thought, well, I, I think I can do that. And, and then, then when I, in work, when I was, I mean, I attend so many meetings in, in my life at that time, that I was walk, I, I could be walking through 50, 60 doorways a day. And then, and then I, I started trying to do that. And, and, um, and it was just that quick reset focus of my personal attitude and thinking to that, of, of just a quick thought to the Lord about this and a quick thought to the Lord about that. Maybe I'm thinking, oh, I hope this meeting goes really well, Lord, be with me right now. <laughs> and uh, it, it changed. And when we had had a seminar on an anxiety and, and leadership and, and that, brought down my anxiety during my work day because I just had this constant reminder that I had a higher power I could talk to. And so that was, it was a bit of a trick in a way, but then I think it was pretty valuable. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we had a, um, just to let you know, if you go on, if you look in Udruga, for Udruga Focus on YouTube, uh, we have a, 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 the video up from a seminar we did on Monday. Uh, both in English and in Croatian. And uh, we will also put up ones on, uh, Ron did a seminar on negotiation on Tuesday and on, uh, and then this one as well will be up there. So again, if you look up YouTube, uh, on YouTube, Udruga Focus, um, there will be uh, um, new videos there coming up. So Steve, do you have any other thoughts on that? You know, God looks on our hearts and he knows our hearts regardless of our actions. And having the right heart toward him in all situations, we're the looking for work, whatever. You know, when you think about the story of the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, he came to Jesus and said, what do I need to do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, he repeated the commandments, says obey all the commandments. Well, this, this young person said, well, I've done all that. Now that was a rather arrogant response because nobody does that perfectly, but nevertheless, he felt righteous in his own mind. So Jesus, having read his heart, saying, well, then sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Well, that was not the answer he wanted to hear. Now, does that mean to know Christ or to have eternal life, you have to be poor? No, that wasn't the directive. 
And in fact, the disciples are saying, what are you talking about, Jesus? And Jesus read his heart saying he valued his riches more than anything else. And he wouldn't give that up. So when we value something, whether it's a particular job or riches or power or whatever it is, when we value it more than God, they become our gods. They become our idols. And you know, God is not going to help us chase our idols. When we pray, if, if something is we're so driven to have that we we don't even think about God and trying to get it, he's probably not going to help you with that. Uh, our heart, I can't say we'll ever have a pure heart because we're sinners, but is our heart tuned to God's will for our lives? Are we willing to submit ourselves to what he leads us to and, and, uh, you know, and, and therefore seek his will in our lives? And he's, he promises he won't let our, us go hungry. He tells us that in Matthew. And he also says he'll supply all our needs according to his riches and glory, which is in Philippians. So in every case, we can trust him. But again, he might say yes, no, or wait. And we have to trust him to lead in that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I asked, uh, you know, in people when they, when they fill out the survey, what's a burning question for you? And I've just been kind of looking at some of the uh, the answers that people gave. Um, do either of you ever run into a situation where you basically ran up against like corruption or injustice at work and found yourself needing to pray about that? Um, uh, you know, something that was really ugly that that you saw as a part of what you're doing. And how do you how do you pray um, in response to things like that when you come across them at work? Can you think of any examples? My uh, boss one time wanted me to do something that was unethical. And um, he was a bully. He was pressuring me to do something. And I'd let you have a bully as a boss. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I struggled. And I struggled because he had a lot of power. And, and actually, I'm ashamed to say I kind of lost my temper over it because I pushed back on him. I said, you can't do this, that's wrong. And, and I pushed back so hard that he, he said, well, let's go take a ride together. And I thought he was gonna kill me and bury me in the woods for, uh, <laughs> for what I had done to push back on him. And, and uh, you know, he, he says, you know, I, I coach you to be uh, assertive and, and I, I coach you to state your piece um, and you did but don't do that again. <laughs> so what he was coaching me is don't be so forceful about it. But it was a real lesson for me on how to be respectful and gentle in the way I push back. But still, I needed to push back. And I had mm -hmm. to pray about recovery from our relationship. Uh, and, uh, and that worked because uh, he ended up treating me very well because he respected that I stood up to him and I did it for ethical reasons. Mm -hmm. When you say pray about recovery, were, were you were kind of bitter towards him? Was that what you needed to pray through? Yeah, and he was bitter towards me for a while. <laughs> it broke our relationship for a bit, but we came around and 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 we worked it out. But I think I think down deep he respected that um, I wasn't going to do anything that was unethical. Hmm. Ron, did that any thoughts spark for you? You're muted. No, nothing really comes to my mind about dealing with non-ethics. And, and I, I always felt like, at least in our big company, um, man, we, we taught ethics and had to take tests and classes and give classes. And it was a constant, um, this is correct and proper behavior for our corporate reputation and the and and, and i and i know it wasn't okay. true across the whole company but um i felt like at least around me people really paid attention to to those type of things and and, and tried to do well you know, tried to do to hear. there was another question um uh, uh some of this I think may be addressed, but, but I, I know this is a very real, real topic. So maybe if you have any additional thoughts on this, what if a person is too passive by nature? 
He's praying for a job for a long time with no answer. He isn't proactive, doesn't work on himself. How do I help him? There is an action punk component to everything we do. We pray, then we act. Mm -hmm. um, the farmer can't say, Lord, feed me, and then watch his fields all day, hoping that it'll grow something. Um, he has to throw the seed. And God does the rest. We don't make things grow. He waters it, puts sun on it, makes it grow. But we have to throw the seed. And so when we pray, we also act. And we, you know, I, I always wonder, how do you determine the will of God? You pray, you use your best judgment, and you start walking. And when you hit a door, that wasn't the right thing. <laughs> you turn and, and try a different path. And you hit a door and you try a different until eventually the door is open. But you have to walk. You can't sit. So being passive is the sure way of not getting a job. Um, uh, God doesn't just shower upon us if we're not responsible. The Bible says if one doesn't work, they don't eat. So there, there is a responsibility on our part to take action. You know, and, and I hate to keep bringing back the potential for just have patience, but but I, you know, I was retired for a year and a half and I was going a little crazy uh, because I was used to driving a bullet train for a living and, and working 10 hours a day and phone calls at night and, and just um, the activity. It was hard to come down from that speed of run. And so I was literally looking for what, what am I going to go do? I'm 53 years old and retired. It makes no sense whatsoever in my mind and and literally I, I i prayed after 18 months approximately 18 months i prayed i said lord you know i i'm i'm doing this i'm trying that and this door gets closed and that door gets closed and then it's just it's just not working i need some direction here on what i should be doing and and literally i had walked into a bible study in a, in a different city that i was living in I, I just visited because it was a bible study i'd been in for years and I ran into a fellow, his name was John Featherstone. And, and John and I had been in a prayer meeting where we had prayed for something very specific once a month for five years, from 2007 to 2012. Well, here it is, 2018 and a half, and I run into John. I haven't seen him since 2012. And I run into John, and he looks at me, and he said, um, I got something that you need to do. And I said, okay, what, what do you got, John? He goes, there's this group called Global Leadership Partners. He said, you're the guy. You need to call this fella here and tell him that I sent you and recommend that you be a speaker for Global Leadership Partners. He says, it's what you need to be doing. I just know it. And I thought, how does this happen? Literally 24 hours after I prayed, that I walk in and meet a guy I haven't seen for years. And he looks at me and says, I got something you need to do. It was... And I, I made the phone call and bam. That's why you're here. I met Steve. It just doesn't get any better. <laughs> that was the punishment part of that, I guess. <laughs> no, the, the truth, that that is true, but it's the punishment. No, um, I, I'm spending time with some really one, another 60 of us, right, Steve, on board. I, I don't know at that time, maybe there was a seven or eight. I'm not sure. Yeah. But um, with some really, really, great mentors and, and people that I have high respect for. And I get opportunity to speak. I met Nolan since then. And, and I think you were on my first trip, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and life has been so much more exciting than a retirement life. I actually don't believe in retirement. I think it's just a, it's just a mistake. And, and mm -hmm. it's it no sense to me to re at least the historical Western thought process of retirement is, you know, you go, you get, you know, reach critical mass on wealth or something and you go out and you find a place on the beach, you, you do what you want to do, you enjoy every day. And yeah, okay, I'm really cool with enjoying life, but I do think God means intends us to work and it works work forever until we, you know, cannot work any longer. What, what does that look like? It's, it's, I'm not sure if what it is for everyone, but um, I, God did answer my prayer after 18 months of, hitting closed doors are my ideas. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, 
we're we have about five minutes left. Uh, several people mentioned something along the lines of, and maybe you can also, because it's, I think it's a kind of a parallel to the whole question about maybe feeling ashamed about praying for work. Um, several people mentioned things like if you're starting a business or you are trying to expand a business, um, uh, kind of almost, you know, a sense of, I was feeling uncomfortable. Is this really Christian to pray for my business to thrive? Uh, and so I don't, you know, any, any thoughts either of you have on uh, uh, knowing that there is a kind of ambition in us um, and, uh, um, you know, you, you really like to see something happen um, and then you wonder like, is this, Am I, is this about me or is this really about God or is this selfish or, I, you know, that, that's a common kind of a struggle, I think, for people to have here. So either of you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. Um, uh, yeah, it's back to, to God wants us to work and, he, and, and he'll bless that. It, it really depends on your whole motivation behind mm -hmm. things going well in the business. Um, and, and, I, and I'll give you two stories. Me personally, I, for a long time, I did not like going to work at the Ford Motor Company because we were making transmissions or just big silver boxes that go down an assembly line every 30 seconds. It would look pretty doggone boring to me uh, for a while uh, because it was, it was just wasn't exciting. But what was exciting for the business to be successful was all the people that were getting great benefit from the business. Mm. Think about hiring thousands of people and having really good jobs because the business is successful and they can feed their families and take care of, you know, whatever they need to take care of. Um, so I got excited about going to work and, and the work being successful because it impacted people's lives because so much benefit would happen uh, due to that. Um, I have a, a, a mentor of mine. Um, he's just recently retired and sold his company. But he built a company in, in, in North America, and it's actually the largest um, company of its kind in America. It was just wildly successful. And, um, and he's a very, very sweet fellow. He's just the nicest guy, one of the nicest guys I've ever met in my life. And, and it was wildly profitable. I mean, ridiculously profitable. And, and what he did was he channeled those monies, and I'm, I'm talking in the, in the means of maybe 80, 90% to the Lord's work. He channeled the success to feeding hungry people in Myanmar, the Karen people across in, 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 in that area of the world, people that were starving. In his local community, he worked in and opened up food banks. And um, he's very motivated, hard working fellow. He prayed for success. And in the end, the success, yeah, his family did well, and that was all great. That was just maybe a bonus. Uh, but the but the motivation of his heart was to be able to do something big and successful and channel those funds to help other people. And, and I never we're still we still talk a bit. And I just love talking to the guy because he just has a, a very clear perspective on, on life and, and trying to do something, do something well, and do it for the right reason. That's great. Steve, I'll, I'll give you a chance to give us the last answer, because uh, while you were while I was saying this, a, a similar question came in. So I'll just I'll read this and you can give us the last thought on this. Uh, I met a man who was a, like a top athlete. Um, and then when he became a believer, he very quickly left his career saying that God told me, if you love me, you won't do this anymore. He was an international referee. Uh, now he and his wife have five children. They live on the edge. They live in deep poverty. Um, and he said that uh, this is the way God wanted me to trust in him. Um, uh, and is, is it really like, is being poor sort of more holy uh, uh, and is, you know, richness sort of a, is be, having wealth kind of a, a problem, um, you know? So yeah, how, what's the relationship between economic uh, benefit and, and belief in God? And you can you gotta do whatever, whatever. If you were thinking about something else, you can give a slightly different answer if you want to, but any thoughts well, one, on? Yeah, one of the Beatitudes says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. It doesn't say poor in money. It says poor in spirit. And what does that mean? That means humble before God, recognizing that he's a supplier and owner of everything we have. So are we called to live in poverty? Maybe somebody is. I don't know. That's God between God and them. Some people are wealthy. Is that sin? No. There are a lot of wealthy people in the Bible. Every time, and by the way, the subject of money is the most sub talked about subject in the Bible. I don't know if you know that. Uh, it, it's a finance book. And, and it always says the same thing. Uh, 
your treasures are in heaven, not on earth. But that doesn't mean you don't have treasures on earth. It means your heart is towards heaven. And so look at Job. He was a wealthy man. I and mean, he was a righteous man. He walked with God. Now God took him through a trial. And then he restored his wealth at the end of Job. When God talks about wealth, he says it's hard for a rich man to get to heaven like a camel through a needle. But what he means by that is, again, if that is your God, if your money, your wealth, your power, your business is your God, and you mean more, you, you focus more on that than you do on your walk with the Lord, then yeah, he's not going to bless that because he doesn't want to be second to anyone. The very first com, uh, commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. It doesn't mean you take a vow of poverty. I'm not poor. Ron's not poor. But where's our heart toward it? Do we cling to it? Do we treasure it? Do we protect it? Do we cheat to get it? Do we do everything we can to make more and more and more? Or do we trust God to supply our needs? He blesses us. And there's nothing wrong with starting your own business. Again, God, you can take anything to God except sin and except your idols. Anything else, he's your best friend ever. You know, Jesus walks with us and he's our best friend. When we have the right heart, we can take anything to him. Great. Thank you. That's I think that's a great a great place to sort of to sort of stop um, uh, because we, we said that the seminar would go till 730. So um, again, we, uh, thank you so much uh, for being with us, uh, Stephen, Ron. Uh, it wasn't as dramatic as last year, but it was wonderful to have you guys give your time uh, three or four days in a row to um, to meet with people. Uh, again, please uh, fill out the survey uh, from the seminar and, and let me know if you would like to um, see if we can set up a slot for you to meet with Steve or Ron. Um, and uh, uh, so if you're if you're uh, need to go or if you're in you know, a time the no no offense or anything if you uh, uh, need to step out but but if you kind of have a question and didn't get around to answer, answering we'll take maybe another 10 minutes or so if you'd like to stay on and um, uh, ask us a final question but uh, we, we like to end things on time like we we kind of advertise them so please don't don't feel any um, uh, 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 this is a good good, good place for, for you to say goodbye if you need to but uh, we really appreciate you being with us uh, this is the kind of formal part of the program. And um, yeah, thank you so much for, for participating with us. We hope that uh, you, you have gotten some good ideas for your own challenges and prayer regarding work. So several people have said that they said thank you for the organization and excellent guests uh, for the encouragement and the, the, the motivation. Um, and I look forward to more of these kinds of meetings and um, someone else said thank you. It was very encouraging. So yeah. Um, feel free to, to go, but um, I don't know. Uh, uh, anybody else have a question? I'm, I'm sure somebody was waiting on something. They were just wondering about whether to mention or not. If uh, again, we help, we'll take another seven or eight minutes to hear, kind of just give. But anybody wants to stick around, so oh, no, we still have another. We still have 19 people on the call. So um, anybody else have something they were wondering about on their on their minds? Dragica, I, I, I'm so glad to see your face because most people have their cameras off. So if you want to, I can't, I don't know Slovenian, but if you can write in Croatian or in, <laughs> or in English, I can try and help them see. Yeah, it's good to see you, Dragica. Dragica leads a, uh, a, a, a similar um, nonprofit organization in, in Slovenia called Poslovni Tok. And uh, I haven't seen her in quite a long time. So it's very nice that she is here with us today. Uh, neighbor country need to support each other. They yes, yes, <laughs> we do. We do. We do, Dragita. Yeah. And uh, uh, I hope that everybody, yeah, that you're doing okay in, in Slovenia. It's uh, um, You've had a lot of COVID again in the last month or something, haven't you? Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we trust to the Lord. Yes. No. Yes. yes. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, guys, Maria, I would yeah. like to thank you. Uh, I would like to thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, really helpful to me. Uh, I find out uh, a lot of things uh, uh, which I can uh, use. Uh, 
And I have to go now. I'm in the in the front of the church, and I have some business here. <laughs> so yes. bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. Uh, uh, somebody asked a question too about like um, uh, being challenged with uh, is it ever okay to do things that are illegal <laughs> or or kind of bend 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 bureaucracy, let's say. Uh, did 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 you guys did you have any experiences of being frustrated with uh, you know procedures maybe even things that weren't even quite an issue of the law but just of of massive bureaucracy. And praying. Did you ever pray against the spirit of bureaucracy in your job? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're called to honor our employers and the government unless it causes you to violate the law of God. Yeah. And so, to the degree that it didn't cause me to not live out who, what I believe and to follow God, yes, I followed the rules. But I also found out that a lot of rules are guidelines. And what I always did was if there was something that didn't seem right, I could go to my boss and my boss would help me decide, is it okay to, to go around the rules in this situation? And often mm -hmm. it was because the rules are not as hard and fast sometimes as you think. There are more management expectations and guidelines, but sometimes something else makes better sense. But I always got agreement on it. Ron, um, you've told some stories to me in the past, maybe this were kind of at the end, but you've told me some stories in the past of, you know, going into rooms maybe with, uh, 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 you know, factory workers, big, strong dudes, you know, uh, union relationships between the auto in the auto manufacturing industry is a legendarily uh, 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 a con confrontational thing. Um, uh, how did prayer help you in the midst of going into rooms where people are yelling at each other or almost seems like they're ready to engage in physical violence or anything like uh, um, uh, yeah, how, any thoughts on kind of how, how prayer and relying on God um, showed up in those moments? I think what what helped me when things would get tough, and it's it was it's been a long time. I mean, I think our company had had grown a lot over the years, but I do remember early on, um, we could be with some really tough. Um, and I think it was more of an act sometimes. Union stewards sometimes need to put on a show, especially if they have an audience, uh, to show that they're tough and they're standing up against the, these management teams. Um, but, but the reality is we're all people, we're all humans, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we treat people well. And I, and there was a couple of things always kept in my mind when things could get heated, you know, um, how could I, at some point in time, share the gospel with this person who's yelling? If, if, if I yell back, you know, what if I drive, wow. the, you know, if, if I show that I can be just as tough and rough as, as, as another person and, and, and I, I probably can, you know, I mean, especially my younger years, I was a, 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 an athlete on a very large school in the United States and pretty, pretty strong guy as, as a young fellow when I worked and, um, and, and I, I worked out probably every day of my life, my whole life. So I've always been physically strong um, and act and, and thought I was, you know, so but, but I, I look at people and go, well, you know, if things get really ugly, I mean, how, how do we sometimes later drive a friendship if we let it go south? So I was always able to kind of stay calm in, in tough situations. Um, but, but also, I think the Lord has always allowed me to keep a, a laser focus on what does the, what, what do we, where do we need to be as a group and, 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 and how do we change this culture? I, one of my, my missions in, in when I did work for Ford was, you know, if, if, when, and early on things were rough and tumbly sometimes with labor unions and shows. Um, I always thought, well, you know, somebody's got to change and where does it start? How do we treat people well? And, and what I do find out when people are excited and your response is calm, and your response is gentle, they don't know what to do. It's, it's, it's not normal. It's no fun to beat up on somebody when they don't react to your, your antics. 
And so, you know, one of the kind of the processes I've, I learned many, many times is always meet anger with a gentle response, which is biblical. It's right. very biblical. And, and, it, and it turns the table and people say, wait a minute here, what, what's going on? It's not what I expected. And um, then you can get to a real conversation. You know, and, and ultimately, you can, if you make a friend, you know, possibly you could have a, a, an opportunity to have a spiritual conversation. So um, I'm not saying I was perfect at this, but, but it, was, it was really in the back of my mind, helped me stay focused. Mm. Tough. That's I think great. One of the thing, I think one of the things Ron demonstrates, and I fully agree with, is Proverbs 15.1, a soft answer turns away wrath. Right. But a you know, but the rest of that is a harsh word anger stirs, stirs up, up anger. Yeah. So when you approach it, and that goes into negotiation also, when you have a soft answer, and I've used this many times to calm down situations by providing a soft answer, it just takes the steam out of the room. Hmm. Well, those are great. Those are great thoughts. Uh, you know, imagine even an angry person. How uh, how could I? really witness to them for Christ if I also lose my temper in this moment. Uh, you know, what is, how, how can we improve this relationship? Um, those are all really great answers. So thank you guys so much for being with us through this time and giving us a little bit more of your time. And thank you for everybody who, who's who been with us this evening and for, for uh, uh, giving a chance for this in your own life. Uh, I know that we all are at very different places in, in life and careers. We have many, many different challenges, but I, I hope there's at least one or two things you can take away from this as a real reminder that um, God uh, cares about our work. He is present with us at work and, and through the, the challenges we face at work, and he desires to en uh, enable us, empower us to be a witness for him in our workplaces. So um, I hope that you can take that as an encouragement. And again, Please fill out the, the survey from uh, from tonight, and uh, we look forward for you uh, hearing about us in the future. If you're not, um, also, if you heard about this through Facebook or something, uh, um, you can let me know if you'd like to be on the mailing list for, for Duca Partner. So thank you all very much for being with us. Thanks, Steve and Ron, again for your time, and uh, hopefully we'll see you guys live here in Croatia uh, in the fall or in the spring of next year. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a good evening. Take care. Bye.